They've won Tonys and Oscars and Emmys and Grammys. There's no red carpet because they're home in their jammies. From Melrose Place to Broadway to Janeway and her crew. Let Seth and James bring all the stars to you. Anywho. They're entertaining everyone, so who's gonna grouse? Just sit right back and you'll hear some tales on Stars in the Hello, everybody. How are you doing? It's Krista Rodriguez, and I'm here as your host today for Stars in the House. And I'm so excited to be here. Um, this is my first time hosting, so you're going to come along on a journey with me. And um, basically what I did was call all my best friends to come and talk to me. So you're going to get to sit in on a little bit of chat with me and some of my favorite people in the whole world. Um, if you are here watching, I'm sure you know the drill because we've just celebrated a year anniversary with Stars in the House on March 16th. So um, we they've been here for a year. So I'm sure you've enjoyed many performances, many conversations, um, many an anecdotes and antics. And I hope um, that had you coming back for more and that you're here with me, but I'm gonna run down the spiel anyway. We are here at Stars in the House to raise money for the Actors Fund. We obviously wanna entertain you and keep you um, happy at your homes, but Really importantly, we wanna raise money for the Actors Fund, which is an incredible organization. Um, I was personally touched by it uh, a few years ago. I, um, I if, uh, if you don't know, I was diagnosed with breast cancer back in 2014, and I was doing okay on my own and thought I can handle this, and someone suggested that I go to the Actors Fund, and I thought, I don't I don't need that. That's for, that's for people who are really struggling or that's for people out there in the world. That's not for, that's not for me. That's not for us. And, um, but finally I was dragged there by somebody <laughs> cause I thought I didn't, I was too embarrassed to ask for help and I did. And I got there and they, it is not an understatement to say that they changed the course of my life. Um, they changed the course of my treatments and the ways that I was able to handle what I was doing. Um, they they guided me through every step of it. I had amazing social workers who were pulling resources from many different organizations. It's not just the Actors Fund. They work with incredible organizations to specifically target what you need. And, um, and the money goes to us. It goes to the actors and the people who need it the most. And um, I guess I never thought I would be one of those people, but you never do. And um, so that's why they're there every day, making sure that uh, they're ready for it when it's when it's your time. And right now it's sort of all of our times, you know, we're all um, in, in precarious situations. And so it's a really worthy cause, please donate. So um, in order to donate, you can go to um, well, you can just donate donations. Oh, st go to starsinthehouse.com and you can go there to donate and then send your receipt to donations at starsinthehouse.com. There it is. Deet, 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 deet. And um, if you want to write a little something or you make a little domain donation, I might give you a shout out. So, um, so, you know, if for no other reason, just do it for the shout out. This is just like cameo. Um, okay. So, uh, so that's that, that's that spiel. I'll give you like a little bit, um, just, okay, you know all this. I'm just gonna read some stuff. They they go for actors, caterers, audio technicians, makeup artists, emergency financial assistant, affordable housing, healthcare, insurance counseling, senior care, truly, literally everything. So, um, you know, we like them. So donate, please. Um, today, we are still celebrating Women's History Month. So I have a bunch of awesome ladies here, which I'm really excited to um, to, sh to introduce to you. You all know them and love them, but you don't know how we talk. So that's fun. Um, and we're just going to celebrate some awesome ladies. Uh, in addition to that, we have some exciting new things coming up. So the National Immigration Law Center has been working with Stars in the House to raise awareness about um, just certain things that are happening in the world. They want to talk about the Dream and Promise Act, which has, which has just passed in the House. And because of that, 
we're highlighting different immigration stories throughout the week. So in addition to it being Women's History Month, we're also going to have a focus on Latinx women uh, in uh, because that's what we're who we're talking to today. So we'll have a little bit of uh, conversations with and with everybody, and we're also going to bring on um, a, a, a separate special guest, Deanna Pliego, who's going to talk a little bit about the National Immigration Law Center and this new bill and all the things that we can do to help. So that will be really exciting too. So uh, I guess with no further ado, let's talk about our next, our first guest. Um, our first guest is one of my truly my greatest friend. Um, she is a a multi-hyphenate performer. She's an actress, she's a singer, she's a songwriter, she's a TV star, she's a Broadway dance captain, and she's a witch. And when we first met, she was the voice of Marta in the Deaf West revival of Spring Awakening with me. Um, she was just a wee child, and I've watched her grow. Um, you know her from You on Netflix, you know, to the tune of 40 million people who watch that show. Um, she was on The Flash. She was recently on Broadway as Bella in Jagged Little Pill, where she was nominated for a T -t 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 Tony Award. There she is, looking amazing in her 90s Alanis attire. But most importantly, she and I share a birthday, and thus we will be kindred spirits for life. So please welcome to the stage, Katherine Gallagher. Oh my God. I, that made me so happy that just filled my entire soul up. Oh, I thought you'd like that. I had to throw in your dance captain credit. <laughs> dance captain got me. Oh, no. I did it for you. Thank you. <laughs> it's truly my proudest accomplishment. <laughs> it is. It's a lot of hard work. Tell everyone what a dance captain does, Catherine. Everything. A dance captain yeah. is, is the most intense job in the world, and I would never do it again for all the money in the world. <laughs> the hours of sleep like, don't pay that much. It's really not that much money. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. So you don't have to do it for any money in the world. You literally just have to know everything in the show. That's yeah. it. That's the job. Know every single's job. Every 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 singles. Every single person. <laughs> Only every, the single people. <laughs> Only the single people. Well, that helps. That helps easier. It helps. It helps. Yes, yeah. I love you. Hi, honey. you beautiful. Thank you. You too. I got <laughs> flashbacks when you were talking about your experience at the Actors Fund because when we were doing oh, yeah. Reawakening every night when we when it was Actors Fund time. Yeah. you would give this speech and it was literally just like every night I was like <laughs> that was the first time I'd ever given the speech I have been terrified of the speech my yeah. whole my whole life that was my seventh Broadway show and I would never sign up to speak ne I would never and um and but then I had that experience and then when it was time to to be on Broadway again actually during my treatments and everything i was like oh, i got something to say because like i said it was really important for me to let people know that it was going to people it wasn't just going in a red bucket and sort of getting sent out into the world it's it's going to the people you hope it's going to yeah so yeah so thanks That's um, awesome. yeah what's going on you in new york city i'm in los angeles california oh you are i'm in los angeles california I am. She's, she's in Los California. Angeles, California. It feels so surreal to be in a different place other than my apartment because I haven't I done that in so long. Yeah, it's very surreal. But it's nice. I'm I'm in sunlight. Um, yes, I know. Like a, <laughs> a wild a call, thing, right? Recently, Catherine and I took advantage <sighs> of the sun. We had that one so nice day in New York. <laughs> one nice really day. That's the best day in the world, like that first day when it's warm. But this was like we were all on drugs. It was like Obviously. the nicest, like we were just like la, 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 the flowers were glowing and it was so amazing. And we out were in the park and it was just one of the truly one of the highlights of our entire of life. Like, yeah, yeah, of the, yeah. Of our life. Really. Like I were naming like the top things that we've ever done. That was that one day of the was days. it. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah. was it. We ate good our top days of your life. You yeah. recently won a Grammy Award. Isn't that crazy? There it is. <laughs> oh my God. Tell us about, tell us everything. Please. Okay. So 
I didn't, number one, I would say Grammy nominations to begin with were really surprising because I didn't know they were happening. And then my manager called me and was like, you just got nominated for a Grammy. And I was like, oh, ha ha, thanks. <laughs> like, that's nice of you, always encouraging. And then he was like, no, <laughs> you did. And then I opened Twitter and I was like, what? Oh, <laughs> I was like, oh, what God. just happened? Oh, and then, um, and then you're like, oh, that's so sweet. Thanks. I, you know, I was like, thank you so much. And then I was like, holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> holy shit. And literally then when it came time to be the actual Grammys, we really wanted to, you know, our last week of doing shows were so unceremonious because we had no idea, obviously. And so, so many, you know, since then our show got nominated for like 15 Tonys and like Grammys and, you know, every drama desk, like everything. Yeah. And we've not gotten to celebrate any of that. We haven't seen any, each other. And right. so I was texting with Lauren and Elizabeth and we were both like, well, if we quarantine, if we test, like if we do this right, maybe we can actually celebrate something together. Yeah. And so they said yes. And then I snuck them away to my parents' house <laughs> and I made everybody, I made um, our cast uh, these gowns, these nightgowns. Cause you know, yeah. you're what, we saw, what we saw in the photo. Yes. This nightgowns I, I ironed on. This is my first Grammy gown. And then we ate every, we had themed food. We had um, a cake in the shape of a pill. Um, oh, yes, had, and it said, it said uh, congratulations on being a Grammy blank and then you, you just like filled in because he really thought you were gonna gonna be right yeah, yeah. Exactly. like nominee would have you know been true both times but um, maybe you're a winner so it said it doesn't it wasn't didn't you like cross it out or something and write winner it was, like, just, a, it was just a blank space right right it was just a it was a blank space and i i really i you know i i'm um i keep my expectations low yeah sure you so got I was like, at the end of the day at least i'll have cake right and <laughs> for those of you that don't know, Catherine loves to make a cake. She will make a cake for a lot of situations. In fact, I've had cakes in the shape yeah. of boobs that she gave me for just to commemorate my um, my surgery. So um, that you, if, you, if something important is happening, count on a cake from Catherine. Count on a cake. That's my <laughs> slogan. Catherine count Gallagher, on Catherine. count on a cake. Count, count, Kathy, count on a cake. Kathy. Hey, Kathy can, can't count on a cake from Aunt Kathy. <laughs> Um, we're uh, celebrating women's history, Kathy. Yeah. So well, we want to talk about some women. Um, I love so, women. <laughs> uh, I lo we love women. Love, love women. women. <laughs> um, we want, I want to talk about, um, I'm saying we want to talk. I'm like, the people want to know. We people all want to talk about, about um, <laughs> working with so many women on Jagged. Like, yes. tell, me, tell me about, was that experience, did you feel different about that experience? Did, did you notice a difference? Was there, tell me, tell me about what you felt like. You had Alanis Morissette, you had Diane Paulus, you had Diablo Cody. Tell me about them. That's, it's really funny. I've been so spoiled in my life. I feel like all of my professional experiences have been um, either with queer people or women, like, mm -hmm. which I know is not the norm. I know mm -hmm. that that's like a very sort of um, singular uh, experience. And and I think especially with Jagged, telling the story that I was telling in, in the show, my character is sexually assaulted. And I think that telling that kind of story with a creative team and, you know, including, of course, the men on our creative team, C.D. Right. Larrabee, Tom Kitt, Brian Perry, everybody. It was a really, really... Um, everyone was so communicative. There was such collaboration. There was so much listening happening, mm -hmm. and, um, which is, you don't, not, you don't always feel heard and you don't yeah. always feel included in the conversation. And, and Jagged Little Pill was such a, a miraculous, um, like masterclass of like, what happens when you get the greatest minds um, from every corner of, of artistry, you put them in a room and they all listen to each other, respect each other and like each other. Yeah. And, and that was, I mean, I don't know if I'll ever have an experience like that again in my life. I, I just, I felt like such a sponge. And, and I think having so much you know, I felt it was a really scary role to take on. And, and you know, that story is very personal to me. And so I had so much fear around it. And especially working with um, Diane Paulus, who I just, I could not love more. Yeah. We had so many conversations in sidebars about 
you know, diving into it and, and creating every single layer. And I felt so safe in such a scary, vulnerable story. And, you know, I don't know what that has to do with, I don't know if being a, having a female heavy creative team had to do with it, but what? I gotta say, I don't think it hurt. That is exactly <laughs> it hurt. <laughs> well, um, look at you guys, you're all dressed up. We're all dressed up, our queen Alanis. I mean, yeah. just to have like, you know, her energy, her spirit setting the tone for the entire thing. I mean, she and the just- album, my oh. God, like, just there just isn't anything like it and there's nothing like it yeah it's so exciting i will yeah i'll say like the times that i've been in the room where there's a, a majority of women or women at the helm i have noticed that there's a that instead there's not a there's not as much um rush there's there's like in the times when you need to be doing more you lay back and you listen more and that's something that i think is really interesting and and i just notice it and i i feel um like I think that's a great uh, part of the alchemy, whether yeah. or not it's every person in the room, but just to have one person who is being listened to, who is pulling back the speed and and making those those um, moments mesh, I think is really cool. And I, I I love it. I love the ladies in the room. Me too. Yeah, let's get Me more too. ladies in the room. Honestly, um, never know. Um, speaking of ladies. Yes. I am going to bring up another lady in your life. Another <laughs> your, lady I know. Has you so were, many ladies. <laughs> I know. Um, recently, there's been a short film made by your brother, um, Jamie Gallagher, about your grandmother, Paulette. Um, and I wanted to talk about your experience with that. Paulette was a dance teacher. She was, I'm assuming, your dance teacher as she well. Tried. She tried her best. <laughs> yeah. She got a dance captain out of it, so she did, and she was the first call. Yeah, she was the first one. I, yeah. I was like, "What do I do?" <laughs> um, yeah. So, talk to me about like, talk to me a little about the movie. Talk to me about um, how it sort of came to be, and um, about your experience with that. Oh my gosh, I had the best time. I mean, that like, oh watch, look at her. Look at her. Mm -hmm. Blue eyeshadow like a queen making yeah, her. She's I love this years. part. Just like stippling on the the uh, glitter glitter by herself at ninety two yeah. years old teaching a ballet class directing this. Yeah. I mean, my grandmother was like just I I can't even. I mean, I will say like growing up having her be you know her and my mom be the, the prime examples of feminine energy. There was yeah. never anything I thought was impossible for a woman to achieve. Right. There was never. It was just that. You know, and I, I was very clear. I think my grandma taught me, um, you know, just led by example that like, you will have to prove yourself in this life and you will mm -hmm. have to work harder than anyone. And you will have to put your head down and do the work and, and rehearse and practice and do all of these things. And you will have to be brilliant. Yeah. You can I mean, <laughs> one, of the, one of the parts of the movie that struck me the most is when she talks about how um, her husband had to sign the lease for her of the dance studio. She started the dance studio so long ago and they talk about how the first dancers were nailing the floorboards into the floor and that, you know, her husband had to sign the lease. And, and that just struck me so much because I think we take for granted a lot of the things that we have that were not that long ago that were very hard won. Ooh, you right. have a story about a lease. Did I, am I making this up? Couldn't you like not? Oh, yes. No, not, yes. In, there wasn't anything not, but when I bought my apartment, it said, this is to certify that Krista Rodriguez, a single woman is a non-married woman. That's what it was. And I was like, what is this? Yeah, what, what the fuck? fuck? What and they're the like, fuck? yeah, for like tax purposes or something. And I was kind of mad at first. I was yeah. like really angry. And then the next thought was like, you know what? Yeah. Because a hundred years ago, I couldn't do this. Fifty years ago, it was harder. Like, and now here it is that I can do it. So, an unmarried woman buying property, watch an out, married girl. woman. <laughs> <laughs> She's. Yeah. I will say, like, speaking of just because, because I can now. Um, important women in my life. Like, I want everyone watching this to really understand like who you are to me, it, like every time I've been heartbroken, confused, stressed out, like in need of any direction or comfort, I will call Krista and and she will, A, she's already like, the first thing she'll do is give me advice that I don't take. 
And then she won't get mad at me for not taking it, which is super cool. And just, Krista is one of the most like intelligent. Oh, that picture. I love it so much. That was one of the last normal days. Oh, it yeah, was. I was like, end of February. Yep. Oh, look at us. God. We are always smiling so much on a red carpet. We, we can't always. Sleep. Except, except for me. <laughs> except for me, just, just bunny ears. But truly, like, I think having, having a friend like you, um, especially, you know, you've worked so much before me, every career moment. I, you are someone who I always go to for guidance. And it's just taught me so much about how much you really need to cherish, especially the female friendships in your life and, and just how much you can bring, like having, having these friendships, having this, like, you know, having you in my life is just, it's changed the game for me. I do, I do not know if I'd be walking if it were not for your friendship. So I'm very grateful. <laughs> well, you're still doing the same things because you don't take the advice anyway. So, you no. know, you fine. you do fine. You just wouldn't have me telling you it's a bad idea. No, I'm just kidding. And I want to have your so much. I don't know I what do. I would do without you. Our, my life changed when you when you walked into it. My That's little Leo, my little Leo sis. When did you, literally, you truly. Keep me young. You keep me young. You, you keep me young. Um, what do you, I have a question for you as we're talking yeah. about women. What do you think it means to be a feminist? Oh, wonderful question. I just sprung this on you. Wow. <laughs> you know, I think it really, I think every single person has to have their own definition of it. I think mm -hmm. for me personally, if I can, it, for me, I'm proud of myself. When I wake up in the morning, I listen to my gut and I, I do the things that I want to do for me. And sometimes that means showing up for friends. Sometimes that means doing things for family. Sometimes that means, you know, having a day where I dedicate that entirely to work, but it means listening to whatever that inner voice is in me and, and trusting myself. And I think that that's something that often, I think, and I think women a lot of times get conditioned out of this thing. Um, and, and, you know, can be made to feel selfish or indulgent for, for trusting themselves and listening to themselves. And sure, sure. that's been a massive challenge for me is analyzing what I actually want, what I actually need. And so for me, I'm proud of myself when I have a day where I really listen to myself, I really trust myself. And, and at the end of that day, I always feel, um, I always feel better. And I would say that's something that you do really well and you teach me really well how to trust yourself. I really, yeah. you're really good at that. I didn't tell her to say any of this, by the way. You didn't. She, I just really she love came you. Came up with this. She came on my show and said nice things about me. I, I just really love you. I love you. I just really love you. Love you. <laughs> really yeah, you're all just gonna watch us like yeah, yeah love on each other. Morning. Yeah, exactly. My favorite story, though, and I know you have a lot of guests, but my favorite story is. I had fish I really loved when we did Spring Awakening, and their names were Regis and Jericho. And I lived in Krista's dressing room because she, she wasn't a true member of our dressing room, but she there she is, just sneaking in, just sneaking in. I mean, I think like all my things were split between your dressing room and Andy and Alex's, sure. and none in mine. Mine didn't. I was. I didn't exist in it. No. Um, the vibes were impeccable in your room, and so I was alone in Krista and Allie's dressing room as I often was. And I they had a little bench and I was just like staring at my phone and Krista walks in and she's on the, she has a life and she's on the phone <laughs> and she just sees me there shell shocked. And I go, Regis and Jericho died. And she goes, I gotta go. <laughs> Hangs up her call, holds me and I weep. I weep in her arms for hours. Well, we and love Regis and Jericho. In fact, you've commemorated them with a tattoo on yourself. With their <laughs> they were members of the family. Um, oh, I wanted to bring it back to speaking of tattoos. Yeah. I think you made a tattoo of, of your grandmother's um, thing that's also in the thing, which I think is really great. Can you tell it, share us what the quote is? She says, she was talking to the dancers who hit their final pose, and she said, hold, hold, hold forever if you have to, and then the curtain closes and you can die. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the and words that's I live by. Yeah, Just keep holding hold on. Baby. Hold. I think it's so beautiful. It's like such a great metaphor for everything and for what we do. And you just gotta like hold, hold, hold. Go and the people who are there behind the curtain to to be there for you and 
when you can't. So um, you all have a Krista to fall into. Yeah, and you have a Catherine that helps you make bad decisions in a great way. Yes, <laughs> that's true. I remember we were in London for a oh. wedding. And there was this like, um, there was this thing on the ground, like they had put it in tile and it said, abandon all plans. And I was like, or a night with Catherine Gallagher. It's said, true. You don't think you're going any, you, you think you might be going somewhere. You have no idea. Just hang on for dear life. Hold, hold, hold onto Catherine and, ah. um, and have the time of your life. Um, oh, all yeah. right. I want to ask you if you have anything to plug. I know you're always writing music. You always have new singles. You have, oh, I was in one of your music videos. It's true. You know, check, out, um, check out me in my bath towel doing nostalgic for the moment. We um, love it. What's your most recent song that you put out? You did this beautiful, like, acoustic cover of one of your songs. Tell us about I your music. Did, I did, uh, the last one was Friends to Entertain Apartment Edition. That was a song I recorded the first night of quarantine, and I did a piano ballad with Ben, who we love. We love Ben. Love ben. Ben. I feel like I saw him in the chat, even. Um, no way. Really? How fun. I, I did, but I'm not, really I mean. I, Give us a shout out in the chat. Yeah, Ben. Um, and so... I just released that. I have something coming out that I'm really excited about. It's a new song. I don't know exactly when it's coming out because I have to record my vocals. Gotcha, gotcha. So, gotcha, so it's gotcha. not too soon, guys. So don't, I see the, the chat, I see some familiar names, and I yeah. just, um, it's yeah. a little yeah. bit, a little bit longer. <laughs> don't. Uh, uh, ma'am is what we're hearing from some people. They're calling you ma'am. They're angry. Ma'am, ma'am. Ma'am. <laughs> Ma'am, ma we're gonna need some new music, ma'am. Um, ma sweet, ma we have a lot of ma'ams in here. Um, there will be we your music. Where can we get your music? Spotify, Spotify, I know. Apple Music, Amazon, YouTube, all places. All the places, okay. <laughs> we are gonna get, we're gonna get some new music coming somewhat soon, somewhat um, soon. from Miss Gallagher and maybe some other like fun ventures that are coming out. I I've, been, I've had some tricks up my sleeve, Krista. Yeah, that I might know about, but no one else. Krista knows about them. A little bit. I just heard. She heard, she heard some things. It's going to yes. be a lot of good vibes coming up. Good vibes. Good, good vibes. vibes coming good vibes. up. Good vibes um, coming up. All right. Well, I think we we did it. I we, love you we so chatted. much. I have so you. much fun. I miss Thanks. you. Let's, let's go to the park soon. We're going to go to the park. When it, when we're both back in New York. And yeah. New York. Oh well. <laughs> I love you so much. Have fun. You. You're a Bye. beautiful host. Thank you for coming. Oh, wasn't that nice? Um, I've you know had no idea how this whole thing was gonna work. And so it's just really nice to be surrounded by my friends. Uh we love good vibes. We love them. Um Let's see. Okay. So next we are going to bring on our very special guest. Um, we are going to welcome Deanna Pliego. She's the policy associate at the National Immigration Law Center, or NILC, as we might be referring to it throughout the rest of this segment. Um, they work each day to defend and advance the rights of low-income immigrants and refugees, emphasizing economic, racial, and gender justice. They recognize that these issues all intersect. So if you've been following Seth and James for a while, you know how much they love Nilk and admire their work. And this is a very critical moment for immigrant rights. Um, she's going to talk to us a little bit about how we can support Nilk's work. Um, there are some bills in Congress that we might be able to help pull across the finish line, which is what, um, what our job as constituents and citizens is. And um, so please uh, welcome, we are thrilled to have her here, Diana Pliego. Hey. Oh, I can't hear you. Maybe pull your mic up. No. Oh boy. Hey, hey what is this? There it is. Yes, we're here. Okay, great. Okay, Hi. awesome. Welcome. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm just chatting with some people. Yeah. Um, yeah. So talk to me a little bit about um what you want. I know that the last Friday we've had some big news about the Dream and Promise Act that was voted on in the House, um, which is only part of the way. Uh, there's still more to go. So can you talk to us about what it is, why it matters, why we should be paying attention to this? 
Yeah, definitely. And uh, first of all, thank you for having us here. We're really honored uh, to have partners like you all help spread this really important message. Um, and yeah, the, the Dream and Promise Act, it passed in the House last week, and it was really, really exciting because um, it's a big deal. Uh, it's a first step in getting us toward a, a pathway to citizenship for people who have long, long needed it. Um, as many of your viewers might be familiar with undocumented youth who've been in the country since they were kids, right, um, but never had a pathway to citizenship, like myself, I'm a DACA recipient. We spent all our lives studying and working here, contributing here, loving this country without having the opportunity to become full citizens. Um, and so this bill ensures that people like me and other people like uh, TPS uh, recipients and DD holders also have an opportunity at a pathway because those are people who've also been here for decades and haven't had that opportunity. Um, altogether, it's about 4.4 million undocumented people who would have uh, the chance to get to call who call this country home and would get the chance to be a citizen in this country. And what's what has been um, sort of the primary blocking for this sort of thing, this path to citizenship, and how can we sort of help? bring that um, across the finish line? Like, wh why is this new and, and, and different for, than what we've had in the past? Yeah, well, I mean, interestingly enough, it's not new, right? Uh, the DREAM Act, a version of this has been introduced right. for um, decades now. And what's new about this bill is that it does combine protections for uh, immigrant youth and TPS and DD holders. So it expands the number of people who are eligible. There were recent changes that expanded the, the pool of folks who are um, uh, who are eligible for the relief under it. Um, but what's, what's also different is that we're no longer under um, a certain president who was blocking um, passage of these bills and holding it hostage for things like a wall and um, other things that are not necessary for passing this immigration that is act this immigration bill that is actually supported by so much of the American population that they support a um, pathway for us. I think so that's really yeah, yeah important to note that it's supported by so many people in the country and that um, sometimes you can sort of forget that something is you might want it but there's a small group of people who are the ones who can make it happen or you feel like they are the ones who will make it happen but in fact it is our duty it is our job to make our voices heard about what we want to happen these senators and representatives work for us and so it's part of our job to um, get the word out and call and say this is what we want and the more people in the country who say we support this the more easy this is going to be to get passed because that is how actually it works. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And so for everyone out there who's listening, um, I think the, the most important thing to remember is that you do have power, right? Um, your members and your senators, they listen to you. And so um, if you go to nilc.org slash action, That'll help you uh, take that action. It'll help you urge your senators. We need your voice to urge your senators to move the, this bill, to move protections for immigrant communities. There's going to be other bills that move as well. And just tell them that we need this bill that welcomes people um, who've already been contributing to this country and who, frankly, even during this pandemic, have been doing a lot of essential work uh, yes. to keep the country afloat. They're already your neighbors and uh, your friends and your your you know, your church, people, your teachers, your doctors, there's so many people that you already know who would qualify under this bill. So let's go ahead and get it across the finish line and give us all a pathway to citizenship. Yes, absolutely. That's such a good point that um, the essential workers have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic and now, and also this, these blockages to citizenship and getting the benefit of contributing to the country. So I think that's a really important um, distinction and that um, the, it, the the bill, without the bill, it disproportionately harms black and brown people. And I think well, we wanna talk about that a little bit today because like we had said, we're this whole week we're gonna be focusing on different um, different groups of immigrants that have contributed to the to the country and the fabric of who we are as a nation. Um, today, we're talking about Latinx people. I think throughout the rest of the week, there will be the Jewish immigration, um, the AIP, AAPI, uh, and there's gonna be a little ragtime stuff happening. So I think it's interesting to note that, um, that this will help in this specific arena, right? Do you, wanna, do you have any more that you wanna add about, about this specific group of people we're talking about today? 
Yeah, definitely. I think one of the things that's important to highlight is just that this bill, even though it's a huge uh, positive step forward that we're celebrating, there, it's not perfect, right? Um, we were really disappointed to see that um, amidst all of this um, awakening that's happening in the country where we're realizing that our criminal justice system is not perfect and that it does target communities of color um, disproportionately, um, this bill still criminalizes communities of color and unfairly excludes many people from Aleve who may have come in contact with the racialized and unjust criminal legal system, who, as you mentioned, are disproportionately black and brown people, including immigrants. And so um, as this bill moves forward, as we continue to push uh, it towards the finish line, and as you're urging your members of Congress, your senators, to move it forward, we really urge you to also uplift that these harsh penalties need to be removed, that we need to um, uh, remove the, the racial disparities in any bill that moves forward. And so we need the people in the Senate, our senators, to act courageously, to lead courageously, and remove uh, these exclusions and pass a really fully inclusive approach that moves us closer to racial justice and equity. Yeah, great. Yeah. Um, I think someone in the the chat has uh, says that ResistBot is an easy way to contact your reps if you want to put that up. If you text Resist to five zero four zero nine, you can text. Um, you know, and if that that's easier for you than calling. Also, again, we want to highlight um, the 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 website nicl.org slash action. Is that right? I got that right. And they all see action. Okay, and you can go there, and they'll be able to um, direct you where you need to go from there. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us before we, we say goodbye? No, I just want to thank you so much for, for uplifting this issue, for highlighting it, and all of your audience members to just um, stay plugged in, follow uh, Nilk on Twitter, and we'll keep you posted on when you can take action on this and other bills that are moving for immigrants. And thank you so much for your support. Yeah, thank you. So nice to talk to you and to get all this information. I know sometimes it's hard to keep up on everything that's happening in the world at all times. So if we can give you a little bit of information that is actionable, um, that would be great. So thank, thank you, so, you much. so much. All right, thank you, Diana. Um, I'm gonna shout out some donations. We've got Sebastian from Pennsylvania um, gave some money. Hey, Sebastian, thanks for the dollars. Um, Laura from Texas gave $25. David from New York gave $50. David living high in New York City. Dee from New York gave $100. Amazing. Thank you guys so much. Um, Mark from San Diego gave $100. And Mary from California gave $100. That, that good sunshine is making you feel generous. Um, thank you guys so much. It's just really wonderful that, you know, this has been happening. This platform has been happening now for over a year. And the fact that you can still, um, you know, find it in your heart to donate and keep this afloat because the fight is not over for um, the arts industry and for all of us, truly. And the arts industry is all of us. You know, we, we, um, we feel essential and we would like to be returned to our, our essential work. So, um, so thank you so much for your donations. Um, I am gonna do some things on my computer. Um, okay, um, I think now we're going to bring on my next friend who um, is a woman and is a Latina, which is the best combination. Um, she and I met in the original Broadway run of In the Heights, where she played Yolanda, the girl in the red dress who no hablo ingles. Um, she made a big splash in that. She's an incredible dancer, one of the most captivating performers I've ever had the pleasure of watching. Um, she has a ton of Broadway shows under her belt. Uh, she was in Women, Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown, Sweet Charity with Christina Applegate, On Your Feet, and more recently, Frozen. Um, she is one of the awesomest chicks around. Please welcome Nina LaFarga. Hey. hey! She's wearing red today, too. I am, I know. Hey. <laughs> Oh my God, I saw that clip. Um, for those of you that don't know, we just celebrated our 13 year anniversary of opening in the Heights, which kind of makes me want to scream. <laughs> like that feels unreal. That like, feels so crazy. I can't imagine so 13 long. years. No, I have no idea how all that time has gone by. Like I have no idea. 
well, you just did a million Broadway shows in between. So it just like didn't, uh, it didn't affect you at all, right? You really <laughs> just. Oh my God. But you know what? It, it also just feels like yesterday, kind of. It does. Which is the crazy part. I see pictures too, and I'm like, yeah, I remember that. Like that, that feels like it wasn't that long ago, but 13 years no. is like such a long time. But I saw a clip, I think, did you post it or some about of you doing that little bit in the club um, right before dancing? I, I, I posted a photo. You mean like oh, a video? Okay. I think I saw a video. Somebody posted oh. a video. I can't remember who it was. Great. But I was like, yes, those days. All right. Yeah. I know, right? That was fun. So oh. you were with the show from, how long were you with the show? Just from 37 Arts or did you did you um, workshop it before that? No, I started at 37 Arts. I, start, I started, um, yeah, we had like a little dance lab, I guess, before we started rehearsals for Off-Broadway 37 Arts. That's when I came in. Great. Yeah. yeah. And developing a show from, have you done that often? Like developed a show from off Broadway or I guess you were with Frozen for a long time, probably, huh? I was, yeah. That was the first time I ever did ooh. it. Oh, ooh, very moody photo. <laughs> moody. Moody photo. Yeah. Giving you, yes, you know, <laughs> snow blizzard realness. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I mean, I've done out of towns, but... In the Heights was the first like pre the the off Broadway as the pre Broadway yeah. run, and when we did it off Broadway, we didn't know we were going to Broadway. No. When I actually joined the show, I remember I was only signing on to essentially initially do a workshop mm. and of some sort, and I didn't even know that it was going off Broadway, and then quickly that snowballed and then we ended up off Broadway and I was like, okay, yeah, this is it. I'm gonna do this really awesome show off Broadway, so rad. Yeah. And then and then they had the meeting with us where they told us we were going to Broadway and we freaked out. So it was, yeah. It's yeah. such a meeting, right? That meeting is like always such a big moment because you're like, what are they gonna say? And then they say what? it, it was so exciting. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's um, that I was, like in auditions for the off-Broadway production. And I was like really down to the end. I don't know what would have happened had I kept going, but then I got Spring Awakening, the first one. So I couldn't have done the show anyway. I just, I oh. just called and said like, I can't do the show. I'm gonna do this show on Broadway. And then I remember seeing you guys perform at the MCC gala. Um, you you did the opening number and I was there with Spring Awakening and you guys were there with Off-Broadway Heights because you were nominated for a bunch of Drama Desk Awards and stuff. And um, I just remember like, oh no, like this show is so good. Like, it was <laughs> fun. Like shoot, like I love Spring Awakening, oh my God. And I couldn't believe I was in that and what an experience. And yeah, like, so what? awesome. You know, I just, I was such a fan of In the Heights after I saw that performance and I saw, I saw your last show off Broadway at 37 Arts and I was like, just so enamored by it. And then I was doing Chorus Line at the time and I wasn't able to, um, you guys were moving to Broadway, but then there was like a kerfuffle with the theater. You guys were like gonna move at some point, but then you were gonna have to move later because another show was coming in, some weird theater thing. And so you oh. postponed your Broadway run like three months which yeah. by the time it happened, I was out of my contract. So I like called up and I was like, hey, is that, uh, how about uh, I'm available now? What do you think? And they were like, yeah, come in and audition. And then I got to do it. So. And, and then you like, rocked it. Uh, and I, I played all the parts. I did played all, all the things. parts. All the parts, all the days. Same there was day. like, uh, there was like, Definitely days, like each show, if you're, I was an understudy and if you guys don't know, each show has its own like challenges as an understudy. Had you understudied before? Have you like- No, that before? was my first, no, that was my first time. Oh my God. So like every one of them is, is interesting, but that one was so crazy because I covered all the girls and if one of them would get sick, the other one would get sick because they're like on stage together all the time. Yeah. So many, many, many times I was like doing one in the afternoon and then a different one at night and then a different one at the matinee. And thankfully you were the other understudy. So we got to be on stage together sometimes. Which is really I know, so, so awesome. Yeah. I was actually trying to remember, I was thinking about how we would be in the dressing room and um, you would just, at some points you would just, be like in and out, in and out, or gone, yeah. or I wouldn't see yeah. you because you would be in, in someone else's dressing room. Yeah. Either Nina, Vanessa, or Carla, 
And sometimes if it was a five show weekend, you would literally be all three and you wouldn't be in the female ensemble yeah, dressing room for the whole weekend. Nomad stuff. Right. And I just remember seeing you like run in and grab yourself. But I was trying to remember like, what was the, was there a, there was a food, there was something that you would always buy to yeah. eat. Right. Was chicken. It? it was chicken. chicken. From where? Yeah. Purchase chicken. Yeah. Purchase chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and I just remember like, like watching you eat the fried chicken, like literally at like the 10, like 10 minutes to, to, to show time, like, like right before the show. And I'd be like, I don't understand how she eats this fried chicken. Yeah. Goes and sings her face off. It's like this big every day. Like I don't get it. There really, there truly is nothing like being 24. There just isn't anything like being 24 years old. Because now I could not imagine doing that. Like not imagine. But I used to eat it before chorus line too. I was in a chorus line, like dancing all day on that stage. I was 22. I was just like eating fried chicken, eating ramen, eating barbecue, like crazy. It was just my comfort food. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, it's so Amazing. funny. That's my legacy is, is fried chicken. Okay. Fried chicken. Say fried chicken, I will think of Krista. Please do. Because I still love fried chicken, but maybe not before a show. So yeah. um so let's chat a little bit about you. Um, so when did you move to New York? Tell me about like how you ended up here in New York and like doing the biz. What, let's see. So yeah, after high school, so I'm from Miami and was born and raised in Miami and then moved right after high school, moved to New York um, and went to school, went to NYU. And so did the college thing. Mm -hmm. And then just like stayed and you know started working after I graduated high school. Wow, and that's that's, that's the short answer. Yeah, that's like so incredible to have. I think about this sometimes. Like the path can be very windy and twisty, but we are just really, um, really lucky to have gotten that opportunity to do what we wanted to do. You know? Which oh is, yeah, do it fairly quickly like i my i started working right out of in the middle of college too and just yeah. like it is a real blessing when you know what you want to do and and those doors open for you so that's yeah. really exciting Definitely. Mm -hmm. um so i wanted to talk a little bit about um i mean i have so much to talk about but actually i was worried we weren't gonna have enough time but look i mean but that we were gonna have too much time but look they were all telling <laughs> me like okay, we can talk it's all right um <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit about your um, your family heritage, uh, since we've been talking a little bit about immigration and how important it is for pathways to citizenship and um, just sort of celebrating the people who come into the country and and make it um, what it is. I know um, your family, you are half Cuban, half Trinidadian, so you have yes. two immigrant parents. Yes. Um, and um, I just want to, like if you had any, wanted to talk about that experience and what it was like to be, um, a first generation and and sort of what you think makes you what what's what makes your superpower for the fact that you uh, that you have all these different um, cultures and that you got to be surrounded by and especially being in Miami and all of that that you got to you know why does it make you um, special and who you are? Yeah, I mean you know it's so crazy. I yeah I was actually talking to my mom today. Oh good. Um, to sort of like get a little bit more of a sense of what her experiences were like too. And, you know, my parents, they had a, they had a good experience coming into the country, which I'm super grateful for. I mean, you know, and they had different reasons for coming to the country and under different circumstances. Um, and, but they both had good experiences coming in, which, I'm, I'm, you know, super grateful for, you know, especially, you know, seeing what some people go through, which is certainly like heartbreaking. Um, so I'm very grateful for that. And, you know, they, I mean, for me, if, <laughs> I don't know if it's a superpower, but like, I, I, I feel, I mean, I, ha I came from such rich cultures, you know, um, on both sides of my family and they're so very different, but they're so equally rich. And, and then I grew up in Miami, I was born in Miami and I was obviously, of course, I was the first person in my family born in this country, um, in, in my family at all. Yes. And so um, I, I was born into a very culture rich 
environment in Miami as well, because I grew up with my Cuban family mm -hmm. that all pretty much came from Cuba at the same time ish. Um, and, and there is such a huge Cuban community in Miami. Um, and, and, and it, it's, it, it is very rich in culture mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it, I'm very proud that I came from these two incredible cultures and that, you know, I've gotten that from my parents. I think, um, you know, in terms of being a performer, especially, they're so rich in music and dance and, yes. you know, and I grew up with that from such a really young age. And it's, it's just sort of inherent in the cultures. Like, you know, I grew up, I don't remember a time where I didn't have a sense of music and performance. And, you know, even like, I remember performing when I was like five and it just, for what, you know, when my grandmother came over, like on a random Sunday, like sitting on the couch, you know, they, you know, it yeah. was a time to, they wanted me to perform or if we had holidays, you know, everybody would bring out their instruments and, you know, and it's just such a part of the, the cultures. So, yeah. um, and uh, so I, I think it definitely enriched me as, as a performer in terms of my relationship, my connection to music and dance and singing and performing in general, you know, that, that um, in like a really like real way, yeah. even before, like in a, in a, you know, in a raw kind of way, like in a, yeah. an earthy kind of grounded way. Yeah. That makes sense. Well, I think it shows. And I think it's like, that's what makes you a, an amazing performer to watch is that you feel it through every part of you. And it's, and it's a powerful feeling. It's like, it's all everything that you came from, everything that you love about music and how it connects to your family. Like it feels like there's roots in what you do. It's not technique and it's not, you know, I took these lessons because I wanted to be this or that, even though those things did happen and you are a technically proficient dancer and you couldn't have gotten to where you are without all that. The fact that it feels so joyous is what's amazing to watch. And that's what I- Ah, oh, thanks lady. Yeah, yeah. And let's get <laughs> Robbie back up. Let's get you in a show. Let's get you back on stage. Right? Hello. Right? We need some money. <laughs> okay. That's right. Yeah. Um, Awesome. Well, I'm going to let you have a, a break and okay. um, you're going to we're going to see a little bit more of Nina in the, the rest of the show. And uh, we have a little special something that we're going to do and um, we're going to see you in a little bit. Great. Thank you, girl. Awesome. See you Good later. Night. Um, OK, uh, we are going to we're we're going to start moving because we are talking a lot, but I thank you guys for hanging in there and um, enjoying this. So um, I'm gonna, before we introduce our next guest, I just wanna play a little video, a little clip of something that um, she and I did together a little while back. Um, it was deep in the middle of quarantine and you will notice that because you will peep that uh, the gray hairs are out. Salons were not open yet, and you get to see my original hair color on full display. So um, please enjoy a little clip of a song that um, I got to sing with my dear friend, Mandy Gonzalez. I've been a puppet, a popper, a pirate, a poet, poet and a queen. I've been up and down and over and out. Woo! All the drama we see. Won't buy it. Oh, sister, mother, Broadway star, or 
tape because then we don't have to sing all the time and we just get to play that. Um, and so anyway, now you know who my next guest is and you probably knew anyway, which is probably why you're here. Um, she needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. She is another alum of In the Heights where she originated the role of Nina and um, she basically only plays icons on Broadway. She was Elphaba and Wicked, Amneris and Aida, she played John Lennon in Lennon. <laughs> she made her Broadway debut in Dance of the Vampires, which was one of my favorite shows when I first moved to New York. And um, she was she was starring as Angelica Schuyler when, you know, the world shut down. And so she will be again. She's had roles on Quantico, Madam Secretary. She's had a million solo albums. She's a concert queen. And she has just added a new title to her, her credits. She's an author. So her new book, Fearless, is available for pre-order now. And she's going to talk about that while she's here. So please welcome my dear friend and inspiration, Mandy Gonzalez. Oh, hi! Hey, 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 hey. My hair is longer. My oh, no, hair is longer. Yes. We have grown. Why have we grown? We made it to the next Why? year. <laughs> and we're still here. We're still, we're in still the here, baby. Seats. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, it's so good to see you. Here. I'm good. I one of my favorite parts about like singing with you and these things is that your neighbors hear it and they all clap for you <laughs> after you're done. Cause this girl will sing Defying Gravity sitting in that Raleigh chair that she's in right now. Yeah. And I'm like, Pretty. how are you doing that? Well, the, the crazy thing is, is I did uh, a concert the other day um, for a, a concert in Asia, you know, but oh from God. here. And uh, so I had to sing like these big belty songs at like one in the morning, my daughter did not wake up. Like I was like, Whoa. well, I, I guess, you know, she's used to it. It's oh my God. Like, that, well, yeah. I mean, she's been singing, hearing you sing her whole life. She's oh my, but singing. right now it's like, she hears it all the time. All, all the, the time. time. I know. Usually mom would go to work and sing now exactly. sing all the time. Exactly. That's amazing. Um, yeah. Well, girl, Hey, Hey, um, I just <laughs> wanted to uh, bring you on and chat. Yes. Uh, hi everybody. To Hi, say hi everybody. You've been on Stars in the House before. I have um, a while ago. I think, okay. uh, yeah, at the beginning of quarantine, and then um, so it's it's been a while. So I'm I'm happy to be here with you. Great. Stars in the House is kind of like Law and Order. It's like everyone, <laughs> we're gonna see everyone on it at some point. It's just going to run forever, and we're just all going to be on it. At hey, some I'm point. so grateful for Stars in the House. I remember um, when the pandemic first started and right away um Seth and James started this and and I felt like we all kind of had a place to go and watch and see what was going on and get information so I'm so grateful for this program yeah me too yeah and and, and it's raising money which is awesome yeah absolutely we got, got more money we got more money we get <laughs> more um, money more money <laughs> um so we're chatting a little bit about being women and we're chatting a little bit Fabulous. about being Latina women. Yes. So I wanted to like ask you some questions about, uh, you know, you are a veteran in this business and mm -hmm. how has your experience changed? Like, what has it been like growing in this business as who you are? I know that I've personally experienced like it changing and evolving in a way that's really um, exciting. And, and mm -hmm. do you have any like, examples or stories or things like how, how have you watched the industry change? Absolutely. You know, um, I started at a very young age um, performing and just having a love of music. And then I really lucked out because I had a grandma who loved Broadway and mm -hmm. show tunes and Edie Gourmet and Ethel Merman and Liza Minnelli. Yeah. And, uh, and all of these incredible torch singers. And then my abuelita loved um, ranchero singers, ranchera singers and uh, bolero singers. And so they all had this, this sound that I just loved and I wanted to, to be a part of. And they were incredible storytellers. And so I was like, well, how do I do that? You know, and it was like, yeah. oh, there's Broadway and there's a place for you. And I just remember, um, you know, all those old movie musicals and, uh, albums that I would listen to with my with my grandma and my abuelita and and I would constantly be looking for names and characters oh, yeah. that looked like me that mm -hmm. were like me so that I could see a place where I could belong in this world and you know to be honest I I didn't see that many and uh and so I think that's why I've kind of during this time I, I've had like a little bit of a pivot to write because 
it's so important for me, for young people to be able to see themselves in mm -hmm. stories, to know that a life in the arts is possible. possible. You know, yeah. listening to you talk with Nina about, you know, her background and, you know, we all come from all different places, you know, but my background, you know, my abuelos were Mexican and they came from Mexico and, and they came here to work. They came during the Bracero program and they followed the crop all around the United States. Mm -hmm. And then they settled in California. And I remember growing up um, and waking up in the morning with my abuelita and having her making uh, tortillas oh, yeah. in the morning. Maybe and she, she would is. always yeah. make me um, flour tortillas uh, uh, because I was like, I don't like, like corn. Like I was just yeah. so like, I don't brag, you know? know? <laughs> California thing too, because I, I, think think it is. I think it is, the flour tortillas are more. <laughs> so and funny. she would just be like, she would just make them. Like she didn't ask yeah. questions, oh, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. But then they would go and they would work, you know? And they would work in the fields and I remember walking through you know the orange orchards and singing show tunes and and wanting this other life and I I'm so grateful that um I'm so grateful that I come from where I come from but I I'm so um lucky that my family sacrificed so much so that I was able to you know have a a dream that could possibly come true and so I I think that um you know, things are definitely changing in um, in our business, but in the world, you know, and it's very exciting. I think things are changing a lot because um, we're not just in front of, we're not just in the spotlight anymore. We're not just in front of the camera. We're also behind the camera and we're yeah. the ones that are writing the stories and, um, and there are, you know, the American stories. Yeah. They're for all of us. And so um, I, I'm very excited about how things are changing and I feel very positive and um, hopeful. Yeah, me too. And I think what's really, I truly believe that so much of the change that happens is because of the representation in the arts is yeah. seeing people taking away that mystification of the otherness of people and um, putting them in people's homes, putting them on, on stages, putting them behind cameras, having them tell their stories. And I think that, it's been very obvious to me that arts has moved the needle in um, acceptance even more than, maybe not more. In my heart, I would like to think more than legislation or mm. you know, things like that. Um, that it's as, it's as important as your vote is, is the way, the work that we do in putting right. out. Well, I think art has always been a reflection in yeah. so many ways of our life. And, and so I think that it can't help but Right, like that, but I, I think the push too. Yeah, absolutely, and and being in a show like Hamilton and and seeing the change and seeing the young people at the at the door uh, at the stage door, you know, it's exciting. Yeah. And then oh, there I am, yeah. and uh, <laughs> but strong. also, but also, you know, um, they had put out a booth Hamilton and uh, to you know get people to sign up to vote and, yep. and things like that yep. to. You know, that never happened before in any right. Broadway show I was in. Like, it's, right. it's part of the conversation, you know. Yeah. Broadway, we are part of the conversation. So yeah. that's very exciting, too. Yeah, it is. You're right. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's much more, like, homegrown. Like, we're all in this together. You know, it's such a different thing than on TV when you have your trailers and you're all sort of separate and you might never see another person that's on the show. <laughs> on if you don't have a scene with them, you know. No, Whereas it's community. Theater, we all have to pull it all together. And if that means collecting for Broadway cares or getting people to sign up to vote or like this affects our community, which is why I think things like in the Heights were so successful because it was a community represented on stage that oh, everybody gosh, could, yes. sort of, could sort of recognize. Um, so one, of my, one of my favorite experiences of in the Heights was, um, was like walking down the stairs and having you uh, in, you were in, uh, Andrea and Janet's dress. Oh yeah, well, party compé. Yeah, <laughs> you would have a. You had your satyrs. Oh yes, it's coming so up. Many, yeah, yeah, I know. There was so many, um, you know, Jewish people in our cast. Like people would mm -hmm. be really shocked to know that there were no less than like six yeah. people who, who were mixed with Jewish descent, which I know you are, and mm -hmm. um, and that was so fun to have not only this one culture where you think, oh, we're representing this one thing. It's like, no, we're representing the fact that everything 
is everyone is represented. Like Aww. the cultural mix that you can see in people, that people aren't just one thing. Um, the more we grow as a nation, we are all a million little things. And that's what's really like kind of cool. Yeah, and exciting for sure. I yeah. love that you remember that. That was so oh much fun. God, I loved it. Oh my, oh gosh. my so gosh, that was so much fun. I think um, Nina was there too. <laughs> Yeah, and I think Nina was there and Olga. And I'm like, trying to think of like the pictures. I'm yeah. like, oh, like everybody. But That's yeah, that was the first time, um, you know, doing the show in the Heights. It's the first time I really felt um, like I, I, I can't even describe yeah. the feeling of what it's like to perform with a all Latinx cast, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, to grow. There you yeah. go. Yeah, to grow, yeah, to to grow up and dream of of this yeah. and then be able to experience that. And um, everybody, we could share our stories or we didn't even have to talk about certain things. We just right. understood each other in a different way. Right. I think that's true. And like my experience was very different than other people's experience. I didn't grow up culturally um, because, you know, there were just some dynamics in the family that didn't allow for that. Right. And I thought, oh, I'm going to- Which happens. That's part yeah. of, you know, I'm the culture gonna, too. I'm not going to be accepted in this group. Like they're yeah. they're going to be, you know, I was very nervous about it. Oh. And um, and it was just never a question. And, no. and it's because everybody comes from their own backgrounds. And I remember Robin DeJesus saying, it's a rainbow of brown. <laughs> like we're all, it's like all the colors of brown in here. And that that was really, it actually- Oh, that makes me cry. That's really I know. beautiful. It was yeah. Really for me to be able to embrace the fact of exactly who I am, mm -hmm. that that it's okay to be who I am and how I was raised and to embrace that and be this version of a Latina woman in the world. Like right. it doesn't have to always be, um, you know, something else. And I try to be really, really um, respectful of who I am and where I came from and not try to, to be anything else. So that, um, that show really, really changed the game for me in a lot of ways about Aww. feeling accepted about my own situation. So Aww, um, we're going to, we're going to pivot now and we're going to talk about cancer. Oh, oh, that. I just really want to get it in. I know we're running, uh, we're running well, behind. You know what? No, it, it definitely has a good, um, yeah. there's definitely a good way to segue into that yeah. for what we're talking about as well. Yeah. I think, um, so, you know, I, I'll speak a little bit like you spoke yes. earlier in the, the show that I had been diagnosed with cancer and I had, I was very vocal about it. And, mm -hmm. um, part of what happens when you become a cancer survivor, thank God, is that you, um, become sort of the first person to get the phone call when somebody else is going through it or one of the first people to say, all right, talk me through this. So, um, I got a text from Mandy a little while ago and it said, yeah, you want to go grab dinner? And I thought, I think I know where this, where this might be going, um, yeah. unfortunately. But I, I actually, as, as weird as it is, I, I love those calls. I hate to say like I love it, but yeah. I, I feel um, excited to talk to people about my experience because I think there are ways to make it less terrible, and I think there's information that I learned that I'm just desperate to share, and so. Mm -hmm. um, I am really happy and I'm so grateful that you reached out and that you felt comfortable to share that with me. And um, we met at Joe Allen and we had food. As you do, as you do in the Broadway yeah, world. In the Broadway world and we chatted about it. And um, I just got to watch your resilience and what, you know, the things that you were going through and still being a mother and a wife and you were moving and and you were still in the show. And, and, and one of the things that really struck me was one of your first questions about it was, will I still be able to work? Will I still be able, I want to still be able so to be my chef. <laughs> and it was so me. And uh, like we, we both did Broadway shows while we were in treatment for cancer. Right. And because it was so important to keep that going in our lives. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about that because um, I I wanted to talk about why you felt it was so important to keep that going. And also I um, another mentor of mine, Susan Egan, she one time talked to me about how she believes that we uh, interact intersect with our roles that we play in the mm. moment that they need to teach us something about where we are in our lives. Mm. And so what do you think about being Angelica Schuyler informed how you dealt with going through cancer? Ooh, these are really good questions. Well, I, hey. first of all, I have to say to you, and I've said this to you um, before, but in front of 
stars in the house, <laughs> but you were such um, a lifeline for me during this past um, year and a half. I guess I was diagnosed yeah. in uh, November of 2019 yeah. and uh, you were my first phone call and you were the person that I called throughout, but not just I called, you constantly checked in with me. Um, and I know you know what that meant to me. Like it was just everything to be able to have somebody to um, to lean on. So I love you and you will always be my sister. And uh, I would say that by your example, I thought that, you know, we've all been through so much uh, during this pandemic. We've all had so much um, that we've lost. And I know that my journey through this pandemic was really hard yeah. to, to go through treatment um, during this time, but I did it and I, mm -hmm. I made it through. And I feel also lucky because I've followed in your footsteps by using my voice um, to advocate and yeah. especially to advocate for early detection, getting mm -hmm. mammograms in the Latinx community mm -hmm. because we are so underrepresented in research, um, doing research and learning a lot during this. I've learned that. And a lot of people have put aside mammograms because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to say, you know, early detection can definitely save your life because it really did save mine. I Cancer does not run in my family. It was my first mammogram. Me and too. Exactly it, the same. You yeah. know what? It can, um, there is hope. So I think that I'm lucky to be able to say that. And I, it's very interesting to me, but I never wanted right away, I never wanted cancer to define me. Mm -hmm. I had it's so much that I had worked for in my life and so much that I had to keep doing. You know, I had drop right. off in the morning, my daughter, mm -hmm. then I had to get ready for my shows and all that kind of stuff. So as long as I could, I wanted to try to continue my life. Mm -hmm. And then I was doing eight shows a week and I was going through chemotherapy and I was, my body was like, no, yeah. <laughs> you're not going to do this. No, I couldn't have done chemo while doing no. and radiation, I, but chemo, it, my God. It was so crazy. And so wow. I had to allow myself, I mean, the world kind of took care of that yeah. part for me, Yes, <laughs> but I had to allow myself to ask for help and yeah. to, you know, let my castmates know. And that was a big, um, weight off my shoulders, you know, finally telling them. And I think playing Angelica and being kind of like the older sister mm -hmm. in the show really allowed me to have a good game face for myself. Even yeah. Uh -huh. I couldn't fall apart for in front of anybody. I had to keep it together because I was the older sister and I'm the one, you know, that everybody yeah. comes to if, there's a problem or, and I love, I love that role in, yeah. on stage and off stage, you know? Right, right. So I think in some ways it was the role that I needed at that time in my life, which is so, I've never thought about it like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Question. Yeah. It was a, such a great thing for, I was like at a time I was struggling with something and she said that to me and I now am so excited when I get a part to be like, what, what are you trying to teach me? Whoever character you're playing. So I think that's really, and I love Susan. Oh, the best. Okay. Yeah. So, um, all right. Well, let's, um, we're going to bring Nina back on if she is yes. still hanging out in the world. Hey. Hey, girls. hey girls. It's so fun to Thank have you guys. Here. Um, we have, so we have been t through a lot through many yeah, yeah. years. And, um, and I think that's the best thing though. Don't you guys think like the fact that, you know, the show has, has a life and I hear from so many people now it's going to have this other life with the, yes. with the film and a whole new generation yeah. falling in love with the music, but it really does bond people together. And we really are bonded for life, you know, and that's my favorite part, you know, me too. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I know it's so special. And everybody, everyone that does the show feels that on some level, which I think is like so amazing that it's just kind of, it is all it's, it, it is in the show, but for us, I mean, yeah, I you guys will be family forever. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. got me. You got you got me. <laughs> you forever. got me, babe. 
forever. <laughs> I know, it was so different because I, I had been doing chorus line before I joined the cast. And like, we, you're literally kept in different rooms. Like you're not really supposed to feel a connection with the people next to you. It's supposed to emulate you being in an audition with some people you don't know, some people you do right. know, you like or whatever. And so to jump into this show that is truly a community, it was so like, so breathtaking for the soul and like how we would have circle up, you know, every day before the show so that we would see each other's faces and know who we were going to be telling this story with every night. And if there was an understudy and if there was, you know, we were talking earlier about how many times we were all going on all the time and things were switching up and we would just lay hands on each other and say, we're here, you know, and that's, that's not something you get always in a Broadway show. And it's, and it's so vital and it could have been very easy to do the show without that um, connection or just to think you could do it. But I think that connection is what really made the show what it was and how special it was. And so, Absolutely. Um, yeah. So oh, yeah. speaking of that and something that we want to bring up before we close is one of our um, sisters in the show, Doreen Montalvo, passed away this this past year. Um well, in late 2020, she um, suffered a stroke and she was hospitalized and, and passed away. She was um, one of the most beautiful and vibrant people that we've I've ever interacted with. I wanted to bring on Nina and Mandy to talk a little bit about her since we're honoring women and we're honoring Latina women. I wanted to take a moment to honor Doreen and um, speak about any experiences that we had with her or um, what, what we loved about her. So I loved everything about Doreen, her yeah. energy, her, um, she radiated positivity always. She was oh. so excited to see you. And then, you know, she was so excited to hear what you were doing and to tell you about what she was doing. And she just had a, such a passion for life. And I just remember Doreen in the off Broadway um, dressing room, you know, everybody would kind of be quiet. You know, you would think Doreen <laughs> would be quiet, you know, like she wasn't really thinking about, you know, what we were saying or this and that. And then all of a sudden she would say something that would just put everybody like in their place. And we had this thing where we'd be like, don't sleep on Doreen. Oh, don't sleep on Doreen. And then she would be like, yeah, don't, you know, um, don't count her out. Don't, don't count ever her count her out. out. Ever. But, no. uh, I miss her so much, but mm -hmm. I know that um, <sighs> her voice carries on. Absolutely. You know, that beautiful yeah. voice. One, one fun fact is that she was the first person to ever audition for In the Heights. Lynn talks about it. That's right. From a bookstore, she was the first person they brought in, and Lynn was like, all right, I think we can do a show. Like if, yeah. if that's what we're getting, then that's what it is. And she would always flesh out her role so much. She was never just in the background ever. She was completely. No. She never marked. Never, never, marked. never ever. Full out. Everything. People like eight yeah. shows a week. I think I'm going to mark this. Like, yeah, not Doreen. Ne never. And, and, and watch her, you get fired and you'd be like, yeah, yeah. like Doreen. Okay. I'm going to do it too. Waving her ponytail around in her heels. Yes. Just loved it. And Nina, you were next to her she in the dressing just, room, right? Well, I guess Rosie she was. was. Room, but yeah. No, but yeah, at one point, at one point we were for sure. Yeah. And um, I mean, she just, and then we went, we, we did on your feet as yeah, well after, cool. after that. But, she, you know, Doreen, like exactly what Mandy said. I mean, she, she, her spirit lit up every room. I mean, she was always so grateful and excited to be doing she did she said yes always she said yes she did everyone's show she did everyone's she came and supported everyone at their outside gigs she did every benefit she did every and she was just like fully joyful everywhere and she was just like such a she was like the spirit of the show i think in so many ways you know and um and to me, she really was such like a, a bigger, like a big sister in a way. And she just was always so supportive. And, and I loved how she, she like remembered everything about everyone, like mm -hmm. your family members' names, when they came to the show, she connected with your parents when they came. Like yes. she yeah. truly like remembered everything about all of us. And she was, you know, I, I I st I, it is really surreal still, you know, just, yes, I know. and especially because um, we haven't been able to see people really. It's like, you forget sometimes that you won't see her. That's how I, I feel about it too. Yeah, and like, yeah. yeah. And she, um, uh, oh shoot. I was going to bring up 
something about what something you said, Nina, but now I don't remember. Um, but yeah. She was oh yeah. Ooh, look at Broadway. Oh, I remember right. now that she was 44 when she made her Broadway debut. I mean, In the Heights was her Broadway debut and she yeah. had done a million other jobs. She was wanted to be Diane Sawyer. Like she wanted to be a news anchor. She had done a million things and then, you know, but this was always her dream and she did it. And that's like, what is so special about her to like be a woman of color and to be an older woman of color in this business and to still be like, I don't care. This is my dream and I'm going to do it and to achieve it. And then to get more success in it, even after the fact is yeah, just, it was a remarkable um, achievement. In fact, she was going to be starring in or Mrs. Doubtfire when, um, yeah. when it was close. So we want to um, honor her. We're going to play a little uh, of a clip of a song of her singing and she'll sort of play us out. We'll come back and say goodbye and thank you all for being here. So let's listen to our sweet Doreen. Esperaré aquí Yeah ah, the best. I remember hearing her sing that at a concert one time and I just thought it was so beautiful so I wanted to to play that but the best so beautiful you, that voice we missed you love but. you Mwah. so thank you guys so much for being here we covered a lot of ground. We talked about a lot of things. You um, did great. Oh, Mandy, your book. Oh. Please your book right now. Yes. Middle okay. grade novel, April 6th. Pre order it now. Pre order Mandy's book, please. Um, Mandy, so you're excited. amazing. Isn't that incredible? Do you oh. just love looking at your name on the spine? Like, yes. You wrote the book. Oh. oh, my gosh. It's like, it's so yes. Crazy. Yes. I love it. I'm so proud. So awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, I love so you both. I love both. you so much. Donate to the Actors Fund. Call your senators. Let's get this bill through the through the hoops that it has to go through. And thank you, ladies, for being here. I love you both. Always. You guys. Love you both so much. Bye, guys. Love Bye, you. Bye, everybody. Forever.